right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Mark. My name is Claudia. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from the Suzy Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that Mark Jenkins accepted our invitation to our show. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, Claudio. How's the weather in Washington? It's quite hot here now. Uh, it is about... Um, it's not bad. It's about Fahrenheit 75, 80. Uh, yeah. low twenties centigrade or so. So it's, it's we are so in the just, summer now. We just started spring in London, so we're only about three months behind. It's been cold until last week. Really? Yeah. 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 London and, is a beautiful is a beautiful city, man. I go there yeah. often. Good, wonderful. Oh, we'll so, meet up sometime. That's right. When we are there, we are together for a coffee or beer or something. Yeah. It's so okay. many. So many great venues, so many great artists, including yourself, in in living in the UK, man. So wonderful. You know, so, all right. So let's go back to the beginning, Mark. Were you born like in a musical family? How old were you when you perhaps began taking piano lesson or guitar lesson? Yeah, well, I can date it exactly because um, as a teen, I used to watch pop music shows on on tv but yeah. it didn't feel all that involved in the music and um one day we changed the the channel to bbc2 which at that time was was quite new and and had more um intellectual arts programs on it and this guy came on sitting with his leg cross and a huge bass guitar and it was mike oldfield playing the end of tubular bells Wow. And that's a very circular section at the end where it repeats and repeats and repeats, completely different from pop music. And not only did I think it was fantastic, but I saw that it was something possibly I could get involved with myself. I mean, I wasn't going to be a pop singer or, or in, um, uh, you know, Sweet or one of these uh, uh, glitter bands that was about at the time. But I thought oh, I can do this. So, um, I got a guitar and I spent about six weeks with it and got almost nowhere. I didn't like the guitar at all. And then um, listening to, I think, the John Peel show late at night, one night he put Tangerine Dream on, which was similar in a way because they had these repeated sequencer patterns, but mm. it was all boards and synthesizers and thought, oh, I've got a better chance of being able to do that without so much technique learning. So um, I bought a couple of little keyboards and uh, synthesizers and, and never looked back. I still play guitar a little bit, but I use it more for effects. I don't know any guitar chords, mm -hmm. but I can play melody lines effects on it and I can play uh, loops and distorted loops and this kind of thing so um, yeah there's always a bit of guitar in my uh, music I can just about get the my goldfield tone which is this very high pitched uh, sort yep. of steam guitar tone so mm. that's still there along with all the synthesizers yeah good for you and I'm uh, talking about Mike Goldfield I think Mike is not going to be tour anymore he's sort of the retirement disappear somewhere i think he is because um he did the 2012 olympics yeah. um which nobody gets paid but the airplay money from having an audience of one billion is absolutely enormous he did 12 and a half minutes of self compositions you must do your own compositions to earn the money so that payment after 2012, he certainly didn't need to work ever again. He'd yeah. been living in uh, Barbados for a couple of years. And yeah. if he was going to do anything, then this year, the 50th anniversary of Tubular Bells would have been the time and nothing yeah. was announced at all. So all that's happened now is a new issue of Tubular Bells with a little eight minute uh, piece on it that was going to be the start of Tubular Bells 4. But Tubular Bells was, was never done and um, um, the uh, actual anniversary date 50 years of Tubular Bells has passed now May the 25th 
So I think that's it for Mike. We've heard nothing. Oh man, it's too bad. I, I interview his brother. I I'm going to be interviewing um, his sister as well uh, yeah. soon. But Mike is one of the all the heroes of mine. You know, it's, it's among all the big names in electronic music. You know, like the Klaus Schulz, the Manuel Gosch, and the Edgar Frost, all the big names. So it's, uh, it's yes, uh, and I mean. Um, he was making this kind of music with uh, organs, uh, piano, guitar, glockenspiel, bass guitar, and it had right. this sort of entrancing hypnotic feel, but not really done with um, electronics or not with right. absolutely. But the same feeling, and, and a lot of people still think Tubular Bells is a synthesized album, which it, which is not. Um, yeah. But it is the way that I've done it now because yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, I've been playing this all synthesized version, so I have a lot of live shows for yeah. that um, this year in the UK and one in Germany. I can show you the the yep. CD. Um, it's this one. So we have the yeah, beautiful man bell, but kind of swimming in a in a spacey background. Yeah, correct. Yeah, um, yeah. I looked yep. at the whole piece, um, which has perhaps uh, 20 layers vertically all the time, and then about 20 or 40 sections horizontally. So it's something like 400 little clips. And I just started assigning them to synthesizer sounds and um, putting in um, a real human voice. Um, and piano and a couple of other things because the Moog synthesizer is not wonderful at piano. I didn't want to go trying to do piano parts. So I've got a genuine grand piano and on stage now I put in some of the other sounds. He used the Farfisa organ so I have a, a genuine Farfisa organ uh, imitation and a couple of other things. Um, it, it, it's the best example ever, I think, of uh, the combination of acoustic instruments like guitars and flutes over this electronic sound bed. And of course, he's developed the album over the years and does a more funky version and a percussion yeah, version, yeah. version with horns and sometimes he has singers and sometimes <laughs> not. And the videos are there. It's mostly on, on YouTube. But yeah. I don't will hear anything new from him at all now this yeah, is where yeah. um, there's a couple of bands going around playing uh tubular bells live and mostly what they want to do is to do it authentically so do it absolutely authentically and they're acclaimed for being authentic but you can get authentic at home by listening to the cd my version has taken a completely different angle on the sounds so you'll hear the familiar composition but played with completely new sound textures and unusual textures and typical mode like things yeah yeah i, I listened to um whatever was posted on youtube and uh channel and it's, uh, it's a masterpiece you you did a very good job and it's it sounds great yes thank you it's, it's been popular i actually yeah. uh, launched it at the 45th um anniversary of tubular bells and now for this year I have a new edition with some uh, some new pieces. I've done a version of Mike Oldfield's single, which was a single off Tubular Bells, but it was a new performance. It used one of the melodic themes, but arranged it in a completely different way. Um, I've done uh, two pieces from his only major movie soundtrack, The Killing Fields. Now, I've done the two nicest pieces, merge one into the other. And um, I also came up with a new hornpipe tune. He has all these hornpipes, like the Sailor's Hornpipe, Portsmouth, uh, Recorder Rondo, and a few others. And he likes this style with a, a very bouncy guitar and then uh, a whistle or pipe over the top, which is often Les Penning playing. So there's about five or six of those by Mark Goldfield. And yeah. I found... Um, a hornpipe that he'd never done called the green ship which is very bouncy and i've got simulated uh, 
uh, whistles and pipes and uh, orchestral percussion and uh, rimbers and all kinds of things on it. So yeah, so yeah. that's an um, extended version now of tuba yeah. and mode synthesizer. The other thing is I'm only selling this on CD. Um, I had all my music on download for, for quite some time, but because of all the arguments about download and musicians not earning enough and things like Spotify playing your music almost for nothing, um, I've taken everything off download and streaming. So if you want to hear the music, you really have to order a CD. Sure. I know there's a lot of people who no longer even have a CD player. Um, no. But there oh, yeah. you are. You have to go to a friend's house where there's a CD player. Yeah. No, I have, uh, I'm old school, so I have a lot of vinyl or CDs like you, and uh, music is a big part of my life. So I spend money in equipment and concerts and... Um, yes. Well, of course, uh, people say, oh, I love the old days of vinyl because uh, the sleeves are wonderful and you can have big pictures and so on. And that's fair, but the space to put them on shelves is absolutely enormous. So I yes. think it, you can stick with the CD, which has, you know, some physical existence. I just sure. download, but it doesn't give the listener a lot of connection to the musician. Yep. You, don't, you don't get maybe all the photos that were meant to be on the album. You don't get the mm -hmm. sleeve notes. Um, you don't take get the physical sense of taking it out and putting it on the player and playing it. And then if I agree with you. Yeah. crashes yeah. one day, yeah. it's gone. You know, and in a lot of cases, you never bother to, to get it loaded up again. And in any case, you haven't made this connection to the musician where you feel, oh, I must get the next album as well. Now, I know yeah. that's not entirely true because there are lots of people very happy with, with download. But as I say, I'm, I'm sticking with CD for a moment until the last CD player in the world stops working and then, right. I'll, then I'll switch back to download sales again. In a few years, we'll have something better where you can get the booklet and 16 pages of notes and this kind of thing. And then I'll, I'll be a bit happier to go forward. Sure. Yeah, have you ever thought about sending a copy of that album to, to Mike itself if you're in touch no, with him? Well, I, it's, it's difficult to uh, get contact with. I, I met him and interviewed him several times over the years. Yeah, um, and actually on the back of my Tubular Bells and Moog synthesizer CD, there's a picture of me and him sitting in his studio. And I put Was... the name in the studio. And yeah. somebody pointed out to me, oh, that, that, that wasn't the studio you were in at all. You were somewhere else. And the fact is, the label had sent a car for me, picked me up in London, driven me out to the country, dropped me at this enormous house, and said, there, get on with it. So I, I thought I was in one place. But in fact, my Goldfield has had about eight different studios over the years. So I've been to two different ones. Good for you, Will. I've been to, I've been to two while he was there. One where he used to own the building at um, Hergis Ridge. And there's another one that his son now runs as a commercial studio. So there were three around London, one in Wales, and he's had at least two in Spain when he moved over to live in Spain. He also had a studio in New York, and now he's in Barbados. So there's yeah. about eight, eight different Mike Oldfield studios. And as I say, I went to meet, uh, interview, interview him on a couple of occasions. Once I think he'd just done um songs of distant earth and um of course he's very pleasant he he likes talking about his music he's very open about the music then after about an hour he starts to complain about the music business he doesn't really like the business <laughs> and for example he did one major movie soundtrack the killing fields and then never did one again I don't think he really likes the movie business. So there's a lot of things that he doesn't like, and he spends a lot of time, a lot of time telling you why he doesn't like certain things. Mm. One of the main 
two reasons he moved out of the UK. He didn't like the smoking ban where you can't smoke anywhere anymore. And he didn't like the weather. <laughs> he said it's just too many months where it's cold. So mm -hmm. once he put himself in Barbados, uh, I think he slowed down a lot. I mean, he's done, I think, two albums from there in more than a decade. And that seems to be the end of it now. But it must be a very easy going life. But I think he was living on a boat there initially while he had a new house and studio built. So he's there on his boat in, in Barbados and he didn't have too much incentive to work hard at anything. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully one day if I get lucky, I will, will have the opportunity to meet him. I don't know if I will be able to interview the guy, but um, it's one of the one of the people that, that I admire, you know, so. Yes, of course, I think it's quite possible. In fact, I think the last concert he did was the orchestral one for Music yeah. of the Sphere. And he chose to do it in Spain, where he has a huge following. Yeah, and that's he right. He didn't do a London show of that. So I think he's almost more likely to turn up in Spain than, than in the UK now. But uh, as I say, I think it's too late because we've passed 50 years of tubular bells and he hasn't got much incentive to do anything else. Yeah, when you have a lot of money in the in the bank, there's no you know incentive to keep on releasing, keep on doing interviews, well, releasing new stuff, I, touring. I think he feels that he's done what he needs to do. It's like yeah. um, Bill Bruford, who has left being a, a drummer now and sold right. his yeah. percussion instruments, uh, and he's working in some kind of academic field, maybe psychology. I'm not sure. But, you know, when interviewed, he, he said, um, I've just done everything you can do as a percussionist. And considering he's been around with Yes, he's been around with King Crimson, he's been around with Patrick Malaz playing uh, jazz-oriented things, he, he's performed in, in some of the, the biggest and most technical band lineups in the world. So, yeah, there isn't too much else for him to achieve. I mean, he's also used a lot of different levels of technology from a very simple drum kit up to a very complicated electronic setup. And um, he's just retired from music, basically. Well, I suppose all these people that we love who started in the 1970s are coming to the end of their, their working uh, career now, 40 to 50 years later. So you can't yeah. expect people to go on endlessly yeah yeah fortunately fortunately for us <clears throat> the people like music would like to see more and selfishly we 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 would like for them not to retire <laughs> yes well of course the the other side of that of course is tangerine dream which has always changed over the members over the years yeah and when the last founding member edgar Fraser, uh passed away they still yeah. have enough people who had been in it for several years to yeah. feel justified in going on. And after 2015, when Edgar died and um, Torsten Quaishning had been uh, more or less um, uh, musical organizer for some years, then it went ahead under Torsten and, and new people. They did actually have quite a big change in style at that point and some people were very happy with it and some people less so but at least they've kept the name going and they've kept the name going busily i mean they're doing 40 or 50 performances this year yeah. the other thing i suppose is you know edgar Furzer, even had he lived um older people just don't feel up to doing the tours anymore um I did an interview a few days ago with um, Coliseum. Now, Coliseum started as a jazz, jazz rock, jazz fusion band in 1967 or 68. And although the band is still going, the original keyboard player, Dave Greenslade, just felt he couldn't go on tour now because everybody now is 71, 72, 73. So they got in a, um, a very uh, um, 
multi-talented new keyboard player, young keyboard player called Nick Steed, and they're going around playing all this music from 1968 plus, you know, new new compositions. But that's the other way to keep the band going. There's still some support from the 60s, but even the audiences are dying out. So you have to do something that appeals to new audiences of younger people. Coliseum being jazz based, they're obviously doing huge jazz festivals and coming to the attention of a, a new younger audience. So good for them. Yeah, absolutely. Were you, um, were you in, before you turn into sort of keyboard attribute, were you in any band in high school when you were, I don't know, 16, 17? No, uh, well, uh, well, slightly. Um, in school, when I was doing um, um, English and physics and the usual subjects, I was asked if I wanted to do music as a subject. And I said, no, not interested. And of course, six weeks later, I saw Mike Oldfield on the television. It's too late. So I couldn't study music um, systematically. But um, because I got interested, I just picked up some ideas myself. The funniest one, which I've realized, um, I went into the um, English department and they used quarter inch tape machines. So I got them to lend me a, a tape machine. And then the next week I said, can I have another tape machine? Because what I wanted to do was to spin the tape out from one machine uh, over the side and back into the other machine and get them to create an echo into each other. So the first pieces I was doing in school were these multi-layered echo pieces. And it was years before I realized that um, Robert Fripp and Brian Eno had been doing this. Terry Riley had been doing this. But uh, although they started this a few years before, it wasn't all that widely known. So I'd invented that technique independently. So I was able to play solo music um, straight off. And then I got a synthesizer and a, a four-track a uh, quarter inch tape machine and started to do multi-channel things because I knew Mike Oldfield had done the whole thing himself by using multi layers of, of overdubs so I was never pushed into doing a band format in any case I wasn't particularly interested in guitar bass and drums and keyboards Ooh. and a singer um, but despite that, I did do a, a couple of band lineups in, in college, which was my first experience of putting together a song with some words. I only did a handful of songs at that time. And then I was basically doing solo synthesizer stuff, sometimes with somebody playing flute or cello or, or something like that, but not a band lineup um, for years and years and years. Then. Um, I was pulled into the world's smallest band lineup, which was uh, White Noise. Dave Borhouse had launched this band from the BBC Radiophonic Workshop in the late 60s. And in the uh, 90s, he wanted to uh, reimagine White Noise as um, a playing digital loops of music. So, um, he didn't have quite enough hands to do it. So we went out as a, a duo. He had the laptop and an instrument he'd built himself, a controller called the Kaleidophon, which was a long plastic tube which you put around your shoulder like a guitar. And he played the strings up and down on this. And this triggered loops on the laptop. Meanwhile, I had a little bank of MIDI controllers and I was changing the uh, filter settings and the effects and other things that were happening in the loops. So we went out for some years doing this. We did the UK, um, France, Germany, Holland, China, which was fun. We went out to China to do a concert for the total eclipse. Everybody is looking up for the total eclipse. A huge bank of clouds appeared. 
and nobody in the whole of China saw the sun during the eclipse. So we'd completely wasted our time go all that way. Of course, if you can't see the sun and it's 100% cloud cover, you just get it goes a bit dim and a bit dark and all the birds stop singing and then it gets lighter again. So it wasn't all that spectacular. Anyway, after that, to a white noise, I developed something myself using um, loops of various kinds. This is with the iPad. After when the iPad was launched in 2010, I started using that for loops and effects and so on. And I went and played in um, St. Petersburg in Russia doing that and then started playing in the USA. I did um, uh, a lot in New York and New Jersey, usually a planetarium show where I got them to switch on the star show and lasers and things above me. Um, so mostly, as I say, I, I'd been doing solo performances and my inspirations were solo performers, Klaus Schultz, who could do it solo, Tim Blake, who could do it solo, Jean-Michel Jarre, who could do it or some version of it solo. So with synthesizers, yes, I thought it can be all solo. Then I was actually put into um, a band that was playing medieval music. And what they wanted was the sound of um, harpsichords, the harmonium, and other uh, classical old sounds. And was very busy with that for um, quite a few years. We did castles, banquets, medieval, events um that's a style that's very popular in germany we went to germany quite a lot with it so i was there with a medieval hat and a long cloak or oh, it's sounding a bit like rick wakeman now um <laughs> little keyboard doing harpsichord sounds and things and we, we built up quite a big set of music um so that was more of a band experience because you have to learn the pieces and watch what the other band members are doing. That gradually turned into something different. Um, it got heavier and heavier until now it's a, virtually a metal band. It, it was called symphonic metal for a while, but now it's virtually just metal. So I'm not needed in that anymore. It doesn't use the same uh, type of sounds. That band is very busy, Serpentine, Serpentine with a Y. Um, they're still, like all bands, they were knocked out a bit during COVID, just as they had developed some big tours and new albums, they couldn't perform anywhere for two years. So they're just catching up now, and they are playing around the UK and, and Europe, and um, doing a new album. But I like a lot of different types of music, that sort of metal grindcore type stuff is outside my <laughs> purview, I'm afraid. So, so I'm back to solo stuff. But then happily, the um, Mike Oldfield and other things came up that I could do again as a, a solo performance. And that's been very popular. I think it's 22 dates so far, one in the UK and one in Germany going to the end of this year. Yeah. I, you mentioned uh, Jean-Michel Jarre as well. Do you know if he's going to be touring a lot, a lot at all with his new album, which is which is great. Some people don't like it. I I do, but uh... I have I have no idea. I have no inside information. I am in touch with the management, but if they knew anything, they wouldn't let on until it was officially announced anyway. Yeah, and uh, they do send me his album so i i keep up with it but of course he's done very little uh boutique performances he does them in these special small installations with a small invited audience correct what he yeah. in terms of a big tour um i mean this album perhaps wasn't suitable for a big tour because it's very experimental and it's correct. very based on uh, the sound placement around you which is difficult to do in a, uh, a concert setup. So we may not see him doing that album. Having said that, I went a couple of weeks ago to see a guy called uh, Robert Henke. He is the co-inventor of the Ableton Live software, 
and as well as performing for years and years he's been a software developer for instance if he can't do what he wants in a concert he builds a microcomputer to do it <laughs> so he's very technical as well as performing a lot and he performs with an um i think there's an eight channel uh sound system by uh, a company called db technic and that puts two speakers behind him and three or four down the hall and a couple at the end of the hall you tell the system where the speakers are and then you can forget about the speakers you can just move sounds anywhere you want and the system calculates which speaker to play it from um wow. his um uh, his other act name is mono lake where he plays more techno things but um his shows are always involved either with, with multi-channel speakers or visual sometimes he has his music controlling a laser or a set of lasers to make graphic displays so he was doing a, a show in london with this um multi-dimensional speaker setup and it is possible to do that now it's just that you have to have it installed specially and and measured up for the particular venue that that you're in so i wouldn't be surprised to see jean-michel Jarre coming out and saying he's done some kind of eight channel sound um mm -hmm. theater but perhaps that would be limited to smaller theaters and not to the right. big stadium type concerts i think it's more likely to just go on, go on to a next album which is a bit more melodic and less experimental and that it'll give us concerts of that we shall see yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, hopefully I will be able to see him. I never seen him. Like you were not only you're a musician, but you were perhaps perhaps still are a, a music writer. I think you wrote for the Melody Nerd Maker, yeah. the Music Week, and, uh, and so, well, so feel free to elaborate on that. So this is my first job out, out of college. Um, you know, I studied English language, but on the side i've been basically doing music with a multi-track uh tape machine and cassettes it was all about uh, exchanging cassettes with people so a, a job came up on this magazine um electronics and music maker and i went down um to spend some time with them and ended up doing about um over a year on that magazine and happily what they were doing basically was having all the new musical instruments sent to them and interviewing all the people who were using them so the first week i was there they sent the new prophet 600 which is the first midi synthesizer the second week they got a yamaha dx7 the next day i connected the two together with midi and i was playing these huge layered sounds of tubular bells over strings and this kind of thing and recording those because some company had sent a multi-track tape machine as well and then the next day going out to to meet um uh john Jarre or klaus schultz or Carl oh. Stockhausen or landscape or depeche mode well i tell the Depeche Mode was a couple of years later. So, um, Electronics and Music Maker was down on the south coast of England, and a job came up in central London on a, a similar type of magazine. So, I moved to central London. Um, so, I met Depeche Mode in a pub on the corner when they had their first hit singles and album. Uh, very nice young chaps. They said eventually, well, excuse us, we've got to go now, otherwise we'll miss the last train home. They're all going on the train home to Basildon, which is a little, not very cool uh, suburb outside London. So they'd come from Basildon. Um, I saw um, Klaus Schultz in, in Coventry Cathedral on the tour where he was taking a, a fair light with him and playing these huge Fairlight sampled orchestral sounds um, and interviewed him about how he was doing it. Um, basically, anybody I wanted to who was available 
to do an interview. I met Nick Rhodes from Duran Duran, talked about his keyboard uh, technique, uh -huh. history of different instruments, and I kept in touch with him for years because eventually I started helping some of the small companies to sell their, their product. So I was a, a dealer for various sequencers and small synthesizers and things. Nick um, was very interested in anything new that came up, even if it gave him one good sound for an album. And he said uh, when I first met him, well, I've just lost all my keyboards because we had them in a storage unit and our management stopped paying the fee for a storage unit. So they were all taken away. So I'm having to buy all new stuff. Um, his big favorite was the Roland Jupiter 8. And it was hell then. By that time, analog had gone down, but it had gone up again. So it was hell for him finding a couple of spare Jupiter 8s to replace uh, what he'd lost. But of course, he had uh, the money to do it. So I kept in touch with him uh, for some years and um, did a lot of interviews and features on, on Tangerine Dream. But then as people left, I kept in touch with them. Steve Jolliffe was in the band in, in 78 and left to go solo. So I did a lot of work with him, put him on for a few concerts, which I'm still doing now, 30 years later. Um, Christoph Frank left Tangerine Dream, uh, started doing movie soundtracks. So I interviewed him and put him on in central London for the only solo concert that he's ever played which was quite spectacular. We loaned a huge um, uh, modular synthesizer to put behind him, which really went up over your head by a company called DigiSound. And we had a big laser show and um, uh, various keyboards on stage. Actually, the main synthesizer at the time was the Roland JD800, which they gave us two for him to use. I'm selling one of them now. So if anybody wants to buy Chris Frank's JD800 from uh, 1991, it's available. It'll go on sale in the next couple of days. Um, and then after being on these various magazines and, and papers, um, I was submitting a lot of features to different people. So I went completely freelance and then for about 10 years was just doing individual features for a lot of magazines, including um, Keyboard in the USA. And um, then I suppose magazines took a bit of a hit about uh, 10, 12 years ago when the economy wasn't so good and a lot of them closed. So I started putting my effort into books instead some put out by large publishers and eventually some that I put out myself. Um, so there was a big change in, in magazine work and the latest one now that I'm submitting to, uh, Synth and Software, looks like a paper magazine. It has a new front cover every month like a paper magazine, but it's only on the internet. They decided, and it was a team who were experience on conventional magazines they decided to build it on the internet and then consider doing a paper version later and they haven't done the paper version as yet i think because the internet version is going so well it has adverts as a normal magazine would have the other thing about it is it's so quick because 10 years ago I certainly felt that I was learning about instruments before the magazine could even appear. For a magazine, you have to be shipped the instrument to review. Somebody has to look at it, maybe for a couple of weeks, submit it, and they have a schedule about a month and a half ahead. So you could take two months to find out about a new instrument, and you could read about it on the internet in two days. So paper magazines really were taking a hit. And I think now that um, internet magazines presented like a magazine, not just like a couple of pages of a website, um, are the way to go. And that's why synthandsoftware.com is um, 
so popular because it's really a, a, ahead of the times.